Okay, good morning, everyone. First, we'd just like to thank uh, United Healthcare for the morning coffee this morning. It's always nice to be able to, to wake up this early in the morning. Uh, this morning's session will be on the, the United States Zika response. It will be a panel discussion moderated by Lieutenant Commander Cody Thornton of the Department of Health and Human Services. So, ladies and gentlemen, I rep, uh, present Lieutenant Commander Thornton. Good morning. So uh, thank you all for being here. I know it's early and uh, the coffee is probably halfway complete now. So you probably got uh, at least a, a few neurons firing. I know uh, for us here, um, we're excited to talk a little bit about the domestic response to Zika. Um, of course, understanding that there's sort of a domestic international interface. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, personally, uh, I'm uh, currently uh, situated in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And um, we have our panelists here this morning uh, that represent various aspects of the domestic response to Zika. Uh, Admiral Carmen Marr, uh, who is with FDA, I'll let them all introduce a little bit uh, in, in more detail. Um, we have Lieutenant Commander Peterson, who's with CDC. Commander Schiffson, uh, who is with uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And uh, Commander Pillai, who is also with uh, CDC. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, allow everyone, all the panelists, to give a little bit uh, about your background and, and what you did uh, in, in terms of the response. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. It's early. <laughs> I hope you do have your coffee. Um, I'm currently assigned at the Food and Drug Administration. I'm the Acting Director for the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats, and I'm the Acting Assistant Commissioner for Counterterrorism Policy. But for 12 weeks um, from August through the end of October, I was TDY to the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response um, to be deployed to Puerto Rico to be the Federal Incident Coordinator for the Puerto Rico Zika response after the declaration of the public health emergency with regard to pregnant women in Puerto Rico. Good morning, I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Emily Peterson. I work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I have been working on uh, CDC's Zika response since January 2015 uh, on the Pregnancy and Birth Defects Task Force. I'm currently the lead of the US Zika Pregnancy Registry. And good morning, my name is uh, Commander Sam Schaffson. I am currently assigned to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services where I serve as the Technical Director for Health IT and oversee the Medicaid Electronic Health Record Incentive Program. Today I'm here uh, representing the Medical Reserve Corps and the community engagement uh, perspective as part of uh, this panel. For those of you that aren't familiar with the MRC or the Medical Reserve Corps, this is a national network of local um, volunteer programs that are uh, supporting disaster response and um, augmenting public health initiatives on a day-to-day on -day basis. Uh, and today there are close to one thousand medical reserve corps units nationwide and upwards of uh, 200,000 um, volunteers throughout the nation. Um, and uh, I was with the medical reserve corps for about six years before uh, I joined CMS. Uh, and so I continue to serve in kind of a, an advisory and support capacity to the medical reserve corps nationally um, for technical assistance and outreach. And um, I'm also based in New York City and I uh, work closely with the local MRCs in the metropolitan area. Um, my name is Commander Satish Pillai. I'm all at CDC and uh, currently since May I've been the Deputy Incident Manager for our Zika response, helping um, coordinate and oversee our uh, epidemiologic laboratory and vector control activities um, for the domestic and international uh, response. Thank you all. So uh, in true panelist uh, fashion here as a moderated uh, discussion, we're, we're gonna bounce around with questions. Um, to start, um, as most of you know, uh, CDC was, um, is one of the um, initial agencies responding to public health events domestically and from the US perspective also involved in these events. Um, uh, when they occur internationally, um, and uh, in, in that in that role, um, they they serve as you know a, a, a initial sort of uh, coordinating node. 
um, when events are occurring internationally uh, because of their footprint. Um, but in this respect, with that domestic international interface, um, CDC um, had, had duality in, in that response. And uh, so in, in that sort of thread, we're gonna have the first uh, discussion with the panelists. Um, and uh, first panelist to, to speak a little bit about this, I'd like to uh, have Commander Pillai talk a little bit about the conditions and the circumstances um, that uh, sort of triggered that activation at CDC for that response. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the CDC activated the uh, Emergency Operations Center um, January 22nd uh, for the Zika response because uh, at that point there was increasing uh, numbers of uh, infants born with microcephaly uh, being reported in, uh, in South America. There was clear need for a coordinated response which uh, brought together CDC staff from across the agency. As I mentioned, we have uh, epidemiologic uh, uh, support, much of which is in our Fort Collins operations in Colorado. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Peterson, is a pregnancy birth defect expert, so bringing in expertise from our uh, pregnancy and birth defects teams. There's a significant component of uh, laboratory diagnostics that are at play uh, when trying to make a diagnosis of Zika. So uh, having laboratory support, uh, entomologic support. Uh, this required pulling resources from um, with throughout the agency and from multiple locations uh, because as uh, Commander Thornton pointed out, CDC has a, a, a large footprint both domestically, we have offices, and internationally. So the EOC serves as a, uh, a common location for all of our personnel to assemble and have uh, dialogue on an ongoing basis and allows us to just be um, coordinated and uh, timely and, and responsive. So January 22nd, in recognition of what was happening internationally, and realizing that um, uh, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus related mosquito-borne transmission is something that we can anticipate would move uh, throughout the Americas and into you know, potentially areas uh, that uh, are within our domestic purview as well because we've had local transmission of dengue and chikungunya in the past in some uh, locations in the United States and the fact that these mosquitoes are present in uh, the United States, it was uh, decided that uh, early on um, that we should uh, activate the EOC. Thank you, Commander. Um, Commander Black touched on uh, a little bit that is pretty familiar, I'm sure, with, with many of you in the audience in regards to Zika and its sort of dynamic and, and uh, iterative uh, response, not, not only internationally, but, but domestically, uh, as new science and, and information is coming out about the, uh, the, the disease, its pathogenicity, modes of transmission. Um, and so with, with that, to kind of carry the conversation a little bit, um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Peterson, um, the, the, because of this dynamic you know, uh, uh, disease and its, its presentation and, and new information coming out as the response was you know, continuing to develop globally, which CDC was involved in, and then domestically sort of preparing for that. Um, uh, what, what makes or what has made CDC's response to Zika, um, uh, specifically with that maternal child health uh, component, um, what has made that um, uh, unique and, and uh, brought sort of a new um, a dynamic to, to responding? Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is definitely a unique experience. Uh, to quote Dr. Frieden, never before in history has a mosquito bite caused potentially devastating outcomes uh, in infants. Um, the last time we had identified an outbreak uh, of birth defects caused by a virus was 50 years ago in rubella, um, and that was uh, quite uh, challenging until a vaccine was uh, developed. Because of this, maternal child health has been at the forefront of the CDC's response and of the response to Zika virus infection. 
uh, as we try to uh, uh, help prevent adverse uh, outcomes in uh, pregnant women and in infants. Um, so because of that, as uh, Commander Pillai mentioned, uh, CDC uh, brought in a number of birth defects experts, uh, reproductive health experts, uh, experts in uh, developmental disabilities uh, from throughout the response. And we've been working closely with uh, arboviral experts, experts in tribal health, um, experts in virology, et cetera. Um, and so it's been a very unique response and um, we've really um, uh, enjoyed the opportunity to step up uh, to participate in this and I think um, uh, give our expertise uh, in looking at birth defects, um, but it's definitely been uh, challenging. Um, we have, uh, for the first time, had an incident manager of the CDC's uh, Zika response that uh, is an OBGYN, um, and so that uh, also speaks to the level of uh, importance of the maternal child health field in this response. We've been working very closely with, um, the, uh, with all experts in maternal child health throughout the nation, uh, including experts in uh, state, uh, local, territorial, uh, tribal health departments, as well as uh, with other federal agencies and um, working with professional organiza organizations to make sure that we communicate uh, to providers and to public health um, uh, the public health uh, fields about Zika virus um, and its effects in pregnancy, and also to provide um, recommendations uh, for clinical care. And so this has been a very unique response. I think um, we feel that it's been wonderful to make sure that we are bringing in uh, the appropriate maternal child health experts um, and addressing this um, problem with uh, uh, that so affects pregnant women and infants. Thank you, Ms. Richmond. So the, I'm sure everyone is, is sort of following still, um, you know, the, the number counting and case counting of a response is sort of waxing and waning, and I'd say a little bit more now the focus on individual cases is, is probably lifting a little bit more, but in, in that context to kind of touch on the, the points that uh, Commander Pillai and uh, Lieutenant Commander Peterson mentioned, now, local transmission, of course, being the, the, the big concern here. Florida right now is still the only state, short of just recently um, seeing some information out of Texas with uh, local transmission that they've identified. Of course, you know, conversations and, and discussion and support uh, with CDC and, and sort of uh, scoping and, and mapping um, and, and verifying and validating some of these things. Um, Given that there's only two states with local transmission, that's if, if as you've been following this on CDC and in the media as well, many travel associated cases, um, and and that's sort of the you know precursor to local transmission, of course. But but with all of these travel uh, associate, associated cases. Um, our territories uh, have had a very different uh, sort of picture, and, and primarily Puerto Rico, a much, uh, a much heavier um, burden uh, with, with this Zika outbreak. And so to, to kind of uh, go in, in that direction and to talk about um, uh, responding and, and uh, um, uh, trying to mitigate and, uh, and address the burden that this disease is presenting um, to essentially a, a U.S. population in a U.S. territory, um, I'd like to uh, move on to um, uh, Rear Admiral Marr's uh, position and her role. Um, and the question here is, is uh, one directed more at the, the federal government's sort of coordination of, of the response in, in Puerto Rico and, and kind of how and uh, in what capacity and kind of why did that um, sort of come to fruition. Um, so Admiral Marr, please. Thank you. So, so as you've all heard, Zika was spreading um, and uh, spreading rapidly through the Americas. And in Puerto Rico, the conditions were ripe for it to just get there and take hold and begin to spread. The numbers began to increase. And as um, Commander Pillai mentioned, there had been a robust response from the CDC and the Puerto Rico Department of Health starting in early December um, and rolling through, I think April is when the numbers really increased. Um, and between 
the Puerto Rico government requesting assistance from um, the federal government and in discussions with the Secretary of HHS, um, they determined that there was a public health emergency unfolding in Puerto Rico with regard to the amount of pregnant women that were becoming infected. And given the maternal child health um, uh, situation with the Zika virus, this uh, was pretty serious. Um, so in August, August 12th actually, the Secretary of HHS declared a public health emergency with regard to the pregnant women in Puerto Rico. And that opened up a lot of uh, federal resources and opportunities for Puerto Rico, uh, brought to bear some resources that were not available prior to the public health emergency declaration. And so the Unified Coordination Group was stood up and sent to Puerto Rico to help coordinate the full breadth of federal resources and assets. The other component of the response is while there was a really good coordination between CDC and the Puerto Rico Department of Health already in existence, um, there was a need to assist in coordinating the rest of the assets, both um, at the state and local level with the federal response assets and with the CDC, Puerto Rico Department of Health response. Um, one example that, that was pretty salient is that um, within the island, the governor also declared an emergency and put the Puerto Rico Emergency Management Agency, PRIMA, in the lead of that uh, emergency on the island. So there was technically a co-lead between the Department of Health and the Puerto Rico Emergency Management Agency, a really nice divide. Um, and most of what PRIMA w took the lead on was in messaging, in outreach to the communication and coordinating some of the community impacts. Um, to make sure that the population understood the seriousness of the risk and, and took the measures to mitigate and control the spread, avoid mosquito bites and protect pregnant women. But a lot of that coordination, um, it wasn't really, it wasn't really coordinated when we first got on the ground. You had Prima trying to do these community impacts. You had the Department of Health and CDC doing the, the epidemiology, the surveillance and the response, the health response per se. So the Unified Coordination Group was brought resources in terms of human resources, emergency management expertise, and public health subject matter experts, um, and began linking the different activities that Prima was doing, that the Puerto Rico Department of Agriculture was doing, that Puerto Rico Department of Health and CDC was doing, so that the community impacts that Prima was doing would be informed by the latest epidemiology of the hot spots in Puerto Rico. And that's, I think, when we began to see a, a, a big turn and, and begin to see the numbers drop, um, being able to link all the different activities that were going on. There were other activities that needed to be coordinated that involved other federal agencies. Uh, you had the Department of Homeland Security with resources on the ground. You had Department of Labor um, with resources that were made available because of the public health emergency and assistance in that. And given that this was a response to an unfolding, emerging infectious disease threat and not a typical disaster response like a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that where you have a distinct start, you drop the, the federal structure, the incident right. command structure in, um, you really were joining an unfolding response. So there were a lot of activities that were separately going that needed to be coordinated and a lot of activities that needed to be identified to be able to facilitate moving some of those other things that had started forward. Right, right. I, I, know, I remember um, uh, hearing about uh, the, the large um, uh, effort to uh, sort of restock the blood supply there as well, which was uh, huge. Yes. A huge effort that uh, was under, under your coordination there when you had first come into and trying to see all of that uh, continue to, to, to be done. Um, uh, sexual transmission as well being one of the, one of the big uh, uh, considerations here um, in, in that case contact tracing. And of course, once you get to a certain point with a population, then it's kind of just assumed uh, at a certain point um, or hard to sort of really um, uh, be able to track the progression of, of that um, in a large population that's seeing a much larger outbreak. Um, 
so I, 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 your point and that you brought up about coordination at the uh, community level is, is I, I think the, the next direction that we'll kind of take um, in the discussion here because um, so much, not just the US response in terms of coordinating communication, um, messaging, um, behavioral sort of changes and the awareness of how uh, cer those certain behaviors impact the spread of Zika, <coughs> especially as, as information's uh, coming out about the disease. Um, other countries were seeing this, this messaging burden and the communication uh, issues, uh, not just in the understanding of the science, but more so the, um, uh, the trusting of the information as it's coming out because this was new. This was um, you know, uh, new information coming out and on the heels of Ebola, um, you know, this is uh, you know, a very um, you know, uh, dynamic time when messaging and responding. And so in the US domestically, um, uh, for states that aren't seeing local transmission, um, community engagement to sort of mitigate the potential spread. Um, I'd like to ask uh, for Commander Schaefson to, to give a little bit of perspective about um, how the Medical Reserve uh, Corps and the units have supported some of the messaging and community engagement to help um, you know, uh, prepare and uh, educate populations in the US domestically about, uh, about Zika. Sure, thank you, Commander. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so the Medical Reserve Corps, uh, and for those of you who have come in a little bit late, this is, uh, you know, a volunteer program that was created in 2002 uh, as kind of a post 9-11 effort, uh, but has really moved into this multidisciplinary approach at the local level to focus on kind of preparedness and response and also kind of supplementing and augmenting day-to-day um, -day public health initiatives. So this was a really good, uh, you know, fit for local um, MRC volunteers, especially um, that are situated, those that are situated in, in Puerto Rico, in Florida, in Texas, they've been most involved, um, you know, since, since early on in, in this kind of uh, public health emergency response process. Um, and for the most part, MRC units and volunteers have, um, you know, partnered with, with uh, community-based um, governmental uh, entities to conduct uh, Zika-related um, outreach and awareness efforts, you know, for the, for the most part. Um, most state and local health departments, as we know, um, you know, aren't flushed with, with staff and are faced with, um, you know, staffing capacity challenges. So we have always, um, at the federal level, as we've partnered with our, the local, the, the network of Medical Reserve Corps units since 2002, um, you know, we've really encouraged these volunteer entities to, to, uh, to help and support some of the, the surge staffing capacity for uh, state and local health. And it's, and it's really uh, worked out very well. Um, so MRC, MRC units have participated in Zika preparedness training uh, and door-to-door and -door outreach. They've distributed, uh, <coughs> excuse me, mosquito-borne uh, disease prevention information materials. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I, I would like to hit on is the fact that uh, MRCs are a trusted resource at the local level. So they have a good deal of credibility. Um, and especially in Puerto Rico, this was important as we know lots of misinformation and skepticism amongst um, the local population around Zika and some of the associated mitigation measures that were in place, um, you know, raised some concerns. So to have, um, folks that are your fellow community members, but are also health pro professionals and other, um, you know, volunteers that are, are supporting um, kind of that, uh, that message around Zika and, and clarifying and providing, you know, the appropriate guidance and outreach. Um, I think that, that actually, you know, went a long, a long way. Um, and we've seen that in all types of uh, disasters in, in, in the last several uh, years. Um, the other important thing that I wanted to point out is that you know Medical Reserve Corps volunteers um, and entities are really strong at uh, bringing the message to the community versus moving the community to the message, um, and and that's something that that can't really be understated. Um, again, that that ties to some of that credibility, but that also ties to the fact that that these folks are going into, in Puerto Rico, um, the MRC unit supported the, the health department there and went into um, federally qualified health centers to provide on-site training 
on Zika to, to the staff that worked in those uh, health centers. They also, uh, you know, uh, made their way to uh, nursing schools, to med schools, to other ac academic, um, you know, institutions where there were health professionals, health professionals in training who, you know, they could take the message to and then knowing that these, uh, the, these students, these uh, health professionals and FQHCs have even more reach to the community, um, you know, that was, uh, I think, a good way to kind of take that message out rather than, um, you know, post things up all over the place and have, have folks, you know, expect that, that, you know, that's just the model that, that we've always kind of had. Um, so I think that's No, all. I'd like to add to that, if I sure. could. When we got to Puerto Rico, they were definitely a, a force multiplier for us with, re with regard to the work that the Unified Coordination Group was doing. And in that coordination, when Prima took the lead on the vector control and going out into the communities and creating, organizing these brigades to go into the communities, into the barrios, up in the mountains to bring the message right. to the people, the fact that it was brought by trusted voices from the community and supported by the um, uh, public health information, correct and accurate public health information from CDC, and uh, the MRC expertise helped the Prima um, efforts uh, really take hold and really make a difference and make an impact in Puerto Rico. So they're definitely a force yeah. multiplier. And, and the only thing I, I would add, that's a good point, and the only thing I would add on is I think, you know, just following the, the last kind of the biggest response that I know MRCs were engaged in in, in Ebola, uh, you know, that trusted research, there, there was definitely a lot of skepticism, a lot of kind of, you know, angst and, and concern, um, you know, all, all throughout the nation here, but especially with our, our folks that were in, in, you know, New York City, uh, in in Dallas initially, um, and so you know that that was some th those were some lessons learned that the MRC, in partnership with all of the lead folks here, um, you know, through CDC and and the, the federal response and the the territory response, um, that that we were able to, to really draw on. Uh, thank you. I, um, I, I, I think that, that using um, the, the MRC as uh, a way to address some of the, the communication challenges with Zika is, is one, of the, uh, one of the greatest, um, I guess, um, uh, lessons learned and, and tools to sort of combat that type of challenge, um, taking um, uh, community change agents or uh, communicators to, to go and carry that message. Um, for the panel uh, in general here, um, from your perspective, challenges or, or things that um, you experienced uh, through the response, um, how, how did they, I guess, what were they? Um, and um, how did you sort of um, address those or, and or coming out of Ebola, how did you take the lessons learned from Ebola and kind of see a potential challenge around the corner before it came? So uh, we'll go ahead and start, uh, but please, everyone weigh in. So, so for the Unified Coordination Group, there, was, there were several challenges. The, the first challenge is that, as I mentioned before, the response to Zika and to any emerging infectious disease threat is a slow boil. So it's an outgrowth of day-to-day -day public health, surveillance and epidemiology that Department of Health, um, Departments of Health and CDC do in their day-to-day. And as that um, you know, epidemic grows, the response to that grows, and then it gets to the point where you have to start bringing in additional assets. At that point is when you should probably identify who your unified coordination group lead is and drop them on the ground then. That's not what happened here. So one of our biggest challenges is that we were, we were a rather large incident command structure dropped into an already robust standing existing um, emergency public health response. So that made the dynamics difficult. I mentioned earlier, it's not your typical, there is a discrete start where the local, um, local resources agencies are overwhelmed and you come in to pretty much take over and help them get back on their feet. In this case, all the, the agencies, all the local resources were fully functioning. The other piece that was extremely complicated is that in Puerto Rico right now, there is a dire economic crisis. And um, the public health system is what I call a uh, public health system in regression. So a lot of the, the types of services that you would normally have and that Puerto Rico probably enjoyed several years ago are no longer available. Um, and there, there, 
you know, they're operating on shoestring budgets. There's a lot of difficulty. We were dropped in at the same time that Congress had appointed an economic oversight board, which was not met with a lot of warm welcome in Puerto Rico. We actually got there with uh, a lot of anti-federal sentiment. We also got there right after the NALED um, incident in Puerto Rico. Unlike Florida and, and some of the other places where um, as part of the integrated vector control, there was utilization or aerial spraying of NALED. In Puerto Rico, uh, and we don't have time to go into all the dynamics, but in Puerto Rico for many, many different reasons, there was a, a visceral rejection of NALED that included protests in the streets. So that situation coupled with the economic situation, there was a lot of anti-federal <coughs> sentiment. So trying to come in and coordinate the federal resources with that anti-federal sentiment um, was something that we had to delicately balance and juggle. And also making sure that as we came in to coordinate, that we did not disrupt the work and the coordination that was already ongoing. So uh, we couldn't just jump in and roll up our sleeves and start working. We had to spend a great deal of time looking at what was already being done, building the relationships, um, and jumping right in. It's kind of jumping on a train that's going 75 miles an hour, and you don't want those you know, uh, carts to derail. And so there was a lot of work toward that, which was very different than when you normally drop in a, a structure like ours. And if I, if I may, um, I'd, I'd like to actually thank Admiral Mar for the leadership and, and, and support and coordination she provided in, in Puerto Rico. It was, uh, as she pointed out, there was a robust activity that was already underway Puerto Rico Department of Health, CDC has had a large footprint uh, in, in augmenting the Puerto Rico Department of Health response. Uh, the Emergency Management Agency of Puerto Rico was also doing quite a bit of work and coming in as a unify, lead uh, for a unifying federal uh, kind of um, operation, uh, it was a it was a big undertaking, and I personally was, was grateful for her ability to kind of bring everybody to the table, recognizing all the work that was already underway and being able to kind of just navigate all of that in, in a, a really, I think, diplomatic and, and, and uh, uh, effective way that helped move things forward without creating a lot of you know, additional friction. So thank you. Any, uh, any challenges, considerations? Sure, I think um, it's, as I said, has been a unique experience. Um, I think uh, although Zika virus has been around for 70 years, it has just um, become uh, clear that this uh, is, uh, can, that Zika virus can cause potentially devastating birth defects, including microcephaly and brain abnormalities. Um, it was very challenging from the beginning to operate on uh, limited but very evolving, very quickly evolving information, working with our professional organizations, our um, obstetricians, our uh, pediatricians uh, who were seeing um, patients who had potential Zika virus exposure and working with them to make sure that um, we provided as best uh, recommendations we could um, at the time uh, and then adjusting recommendations as new information becomes available. And so we're uh, very happy that new information is becoming available. We've implemented uh, surveillance systems, um, including the US Zika Pregnancy Registry um, and birth effects surveillance, uh, specifically looking at birth effects potentially related to Zika virus. Um, and so I think we're learning more every day and that's been really rewarding uh, to learn more every day, but definitely it is challenging when um, there's uh, initially not a lot of um, knowledge um, and needing to look at other similar viruses and um, other uh, similar um, congenital infections um, and uh, thinking about what is appropriate uh, to uh, provide guidance on. The other um, challenge that I think is unique to um, this, uh, to Zika virus and um, 
its uh, effects on birth defects is that um, a woman could get infected in her first trimester and then not have a, um, a birth defect identified until delivery. Of course, sometimes it can be identified during uh, pregnancy with ultrasound. However, um, there is the potential that um, someone could get infected, may not be symptomatic, may have mild symptoms, and then have uh, birth defects um, identified you know, many months later. And so I think that is a challenging um, message uh, to uh, cr uh, create to the public that um, you know people may be falsely reassured, saying we're not seeing any birth effects, but in fact, in fact, an infection um, at one month can lead to uh, birth effects identified many months later. And so I think making sure that. Um, uh, the public is aware, providers are aware, making sure that we are uh, providing appropriate care, um, and then also referral to services as needed. Uh, if if I may. One of the, the challenges, and Admiral Marr alluded to this, unlike other, uh, like a natural disaster with uh, emerging and new infectious diseases, when we're in this epidemic uh, spread, we see these novel presentations that you just did not, uh, you wouldn't have uh, known when there were just small numbers of cases. And it, from a clinical perspective, that uh, makes sense because uh, the uh, spectrum of, of disease can be varied when you have large numbers of people that are infected or uh, affected. And so when uh, Emily says, you know, we learn more every day, it really is because today w there are so many more people that have now been affected with Zika than we had seen in the preceding 70 years. And so it, that creates a very unique challenge for a public health emergency response because you have to uh, be able to pivot pretty quickly uh, across multiple disciplines, uh, in this one in particular, you have pregnancy considerations, uh, post-pregnancy follow-up of potentially affected infants, coordinating that with the appropriate diagnostic testing, uh, and then trying to do this at scale uh, becomes that much more, more challenging. So it, it really is a, uh, a unique type of emergency response. And, and if you add to that the fact that I think it's 80% of the population is asymptomatic, mm -hmm. so you're only really dealing with the symptomatic, and in a place like Puerto Rico that has dealt with many, many years with dengue, they've learned mm -hmm. to live and survive, and it's just a way of life. Um, and then they have chikungunya that arrived in Puerto Rico a couple years ago, had its big epidemic rise, and then kind of plateaued. It was a very difficult message, and it's still, I think, a very difficult message for many to understand the seriousness and the role that even the non-pregnant, non-high-risk population has to play in mitigating and controlling the spread of the disease. Because I don't get sick, um, it's not affecting me, I'm not a woman who's trying to get pregnant, I'm not a, a, a dad who's trying to, to get my partner pregnant, it doesn't affect me, so I don't have mm -hmm. to take precautions, plus, you know, there's dengue, there's chikungunya, now there's Zika. So that added a level of complexity um, to a, a challenge to being able to respond to mitigate that that was very difficult to address. Mm -hmm. I could just uh, add, because I think you, you, the, the panel, yeah, each panel has raised, you know, most of the points, but broadly, I think, you know, the raising awareness, uh, and kind of that broader messaging is, was a, a huge challenge. Um, the skepticism that I mentioned early on, I think that's a natural challenge to overcome um, in different ways in, in all disasters. And I think, uh, I know if we have all the time in the world, we'd be talking about uh, resources and um, how to best allocate those resources um, if we had more of those, you know, um, you know public resources to support. Uh, this response, and not just not just funding, right. um, but general um, resources, um, you know, pumped into 
the, um, the infrastructure to, to support um, this, this public health emergency. And the one thing that I wanted to add, which I think in every, uh, you know, we're, we're always dealing with, with disaster. I think that's what, we're, you know, it drives and motivates. Uh, I know a lot of the folks that are uh, my fellow commission corps officers and, 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 and probably uh, many of you. Um, but one thing that we've always learned uh, in, in these disasters that we've participated in is that oftentimes we're meeting one another, those who are fellow responders, you know, during the course of the response. Um, and I think it's important, and we talk about this in every after action, to, f to figure out ways to make those connections and do that friend building beforehand and in advance so that it could be an even more uh, impactful and, and effective um, response. And this was obviously a unique and continues to be a unique um, scenario and, and different from the last one and will be different from the next one or whatever else is ongoing right now. But, um, you know, to the extent possible that I think that that's always something that we like to, to talk about um, because we talk about an after action and then, um, you know, we, it's, 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 it's a little bit more difficult and complex to actually um, incorporate and, and implement as a follow up. Great. I, um, I, I think the, the conversation here about <coughs> the, the, the complexity and the challenges that, you know, kind of span the, the gambit of, of normal response in one respect, but because you have multiple areas, you have multiple challenges in each of those different lanes, you know, going from what you would normally have with an infectious disease, uh, diagnostics, um, you know, laboratory testing. Well, in this case, we had a diagnostic test of which, you know, did have a propensity for higher false positives in certain ways or cross reactivity with the existing, which creates a, you know, can, can at times undermine the, the, um, uh, the, the vigilance in, in reporting cases in a, in a, in a, in a quick way and understanding the scope um, of, of the disease and as it's spreading. Um, I think that uh, if, if we were to um, look at the challenges that we had had, even with just Ebola, which was very recent, it would be very hard to just say all of those lessons learned apply here because we have so many different aspects and, and one infectious disease is not nearer the mm -hmm. next. You take certain things and sort of adapt and, and uh, as you can, um, but hearing a lot of the responders and as you said, as you meet them during a response, mm -hmm. talk with them, and people say, well, this is very you know, reminiscent of Ebola. We had some of these very similar coordination issues, set very similar um, internal you know, coordination issues, very similar external coordination, but it's, you know, while we might have 80% similar in a lot of these, it's that last 20% that gets you to the finish line, and that's always unique to every single response. Um, uh, given that we're, we're close to time here, I'd like to sort of end uh, the, the conversation um, with, uh, we've already talked a little bit about challenges, so I don't think we need to sort of uh, continue to, to, to go down that road, but from each of uh, the panelists' perspective, given what you know now and how the response has gone, if you had known that uh, earlier on in the response in, when you engaged, um, in what ways might you have uh, changed or uh, incorporated some of these, uh, some of this experience and, and uh, knowledge that you now have earlier on in the response to sort of change the trajectory or help improve uh, uh, efforts at, at the time earlier on in the response. So we'll kind of go down the line here. Right so, so I alluded earlier to the structure and the construct of it being a, the, the unified coordination group was a traditional ICS FIG structure, drop it in, which is what you do in an emergency. Um, the construct that we had was an HHS-led, because you needed public health um, subject matter expertise in the lead, supported by FEMA emergency, manager, emergency management expertise. I think that is a wonderful construct. I think using the ICS structure and the processes was extremely helpful for us. That said, the way we did it, we dropped in the UCG large footprint to then reduce the footprint once you get on the ground and things start working normally, doesn't work here. We dropped a large footprint in. It took us a while to really assess. So what I would do differently and going forward for unfolding slow boil public health emergency responses is begin to identify what your UCG leadership team, and that should include an intergovernmental affairs expert. Yeah, right. That was instrumental for us. 
drop those two or those three people in with the CDC unfolding response as they begin to bring in assets and together determine how do you grow that UCG so that you can begin to tap all those other federal resources and begin to think creatively of what already exists in the absence of any declared public health emergency. How can you stretch those things? Right. There were many things that we did that we didn't necessarily need the public health emergency declaration to achieve. Yeah. It's just the public health emergency declaration led us to think in that way. There were other things that the emergency declaration did allow, like the Department of Labor Displaced Worker Grant, which was instrumental in putting together some of the brigades that are gonna continue to work. But I think that's the one thing I would do differently okay. for a public health emergency, slow boil, right. emerging infection disease threat, grow that structure small to big and don't drop in the big structure to try and then reduce it. Um, I think from my side, uh, as, uh, it's been really um, engaging to, make, to bring the maternal child health uh, field to the forefront in a response. Um, I think that we have built a lot of um, coordination and connections um, with other uh, fields in public health. Uh, that were not um, necessarily there on a regular basis. Um, usually a lot of places, maternal child health and infectious disease may op uh, operate separately or be in silos, but I think, um, but still have some coordination on specific uh, diseases, but I think really this response has allowed um, the maternal child health, infectious disease, um, laboratory, um, et cetera, a lot of more coordination. And so I think that um, that had, uh, has developed over time on the response. I think that um, hopefully with a new uh, outbreak, um, those um, relationships can be in place and uh, you know uh, work together in coordination faster and um, more efficiently. And if I may just real quickly, um, from an MRC and a community sort of uh, volunteer or engagement standpoint, um, I think you know giving a little bit more uh, a buy-in to those folks, bringing, bringing volunteers to the, the table early and often um, is, is something that uh, is, is really important. Um, you know, while they're not necessarily, you know, paid to do this work, they are at the community level, they do know what's going on and have, uh, you know, quote unquote street cred. Um, and hopefully that's something that could be helpful and, and a challenge and, and then maybe, um, pumping in some resources into some of the challenges associated with, um, you know, volunteers making sure that they have the appropriate credentialing in advance, which, um, you know, in Puerto Rico, those volunteers did, and they worked very closely with the health department, but that's not th necessarily the case nationwide. And this, the second piece, which we've been battling since the inception of the Medical Reserve Corps program is legal protections. Mm -hmm. uh, these, are, these are physicians, these are uh, nurses, these are all types of, uh, you know, health professionals that are wanting to support the, the cause, um, but knowing that their workers uh, comp or their uh, liability, um, you know, is, is not necessarily covered. And, and there are some solutions, but I think if that can be strengthened, uh, they could really truly serve as force multipliers in a, um, an emergency. So I think from my perspective, you know, I'm putting the Zika response in context of what CDC has been doing in the emergency response arena for the past going on three plus years now. We, we came off of a MERS-CoV response, rolled right into the Ebola response, um, and then um, we deactivated our Ebola response in March of 2016 while the um, Zika response uh, was about two months uh, uh, into, uh, into its activation. And um, there have been a lot of lessons learned and a lot of the personnel that are currently in this response um, got a lot of experience in the past two years. And so it touches on something, you know, like this idea of like, having that experience, having those relationships 
beforehand. Mm -hmm. I'd had the opportunity to work with Admiral Marr beforehand on other activities. So we were able to like, we, you kind of just transition mm -hmm. very quickly when you have those existing relationships. And as Lieutenant Commander Peterson pointed out, early on, like the maternal child health teams, it was a, it was a, it was new potentially, or, or it wasn't as common for the maternal child health teams to be integrated into the emergency response uh, activities, either at the state or local level, uh, and uh, potentially at the federal level. So, you know, thinking through for the next time, like who are the other groups that typically don't have a, um, uh, may not have had a. Uh, a major role in past activations that we want to think through. And so when there is the next activation with the next unknown pathogen that we have already established those relationships and, and we know the way that those groups view data and view interactions with their um, respective uh, stakeholders and, and so that our engagements are as smooth and as dynamic as possible because the, I think communication and coordination, they're, they're cliche, but they really are what makes or breaks, I think, a response. Um, so I think it's more like projecting out what we want to do for the next uh, event. Thank you. No, thank you, great, great points. I, um, I, I want to thank you all for, the, for your time and, and being a part of the panel. Um, I think that uh, the sort of underlying tone here is um, the, the slow boil ultimately is, you know, uh, right now is what we're getting to at the end of everyone's, you know, points here of what to do better next time. It's, it's uh, recognizing that you're a boiling frog before you are actually a boiled frog, right? Um, <laughs> we don't want that to happen. And, and so, and that's one of the things that you sort of hear from the global perspective as well in the declaration of a FIAC, which is sort of really what launched this internationally of the declaration of a FIAC from WHO for what essentially wasn't the normal model. They normally declared a FIAC or the idea of declared FIAC was, you know, you had the Ebola, right? You, you, you had an H1N1, but with the declaration of this FIAC, it was more about the unknown and the potential trajectory for something, which was what they had sort of, um, what had sort of been one of the issues with Ebola, coming out of Ebola. It wasn't declared soon enough to sort of get everyone working. And this gets to the point about having everyone there at the table that could possibly be there earlier. And then if you recognize that you don't need them, then it's easier to sort of say, okay, you can go ahead and stand down because we see that this might not be something where we need that. But adding people as the response is going sometimes can kind of create the, you know, we need something big, we bring a lot, and then trying to actually sort of receive that and, and implement that at a lower level, the sooner the better with everyone to sort of give their perspective. Um, but thank you all um, for your time. Uh, I think we'll conclude our panel and uh, we'll turn over for the rest of the day. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So on, 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 be, uh, on behalf of AMSIS, we wanna thank the panel this morning. We know it's tough to, to, do, the, to do the Reveille session early in the morning. And uh, we want to thank the audience for, for popping in. Um, and just one, one follow-up kind of comment, um, Commander, and, I, and, and I'm going to really mess your name up, so I'm not going to say it. Um, talked about building relationships and, and just wanted to mention that. That's what AMSIS is all about, and we hope that our meeting here allows these relationships to build. So again, thank you once again. And we'll be starting our program about eight o'clock. Um, so everybody take a few minutes and then come on back. Thanks again. Thank you.